Coming up, the Galaxy Note 3, the HP Z Book, the Death Adder, a camera that costs way too much, and a Macintosh that ought to cost a lot more. It's time to watch before you buy. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Before You Buy is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Before You Buy is brought to you by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, visit audiblepodcast.com slash before you buy. Hello and welcome to Before You Buy, the Twit Product Review Show, where we get all the latest and greatest products. We gather them together and disseminate them to our wonderful staff, where they're going to give us a real-world look at what it's like to actually use and own the things that we have. Now, we want to start off with a, a tablet. You know, there's so many great tablets out there. iPad, of course. But then uh, there's a lot of Android choices. Google has its Nexus line. Samsung, though, seems to be the number one Android tablet. This is the Galaxy Note 3. Uh, we gave it to Jason Howell of All About Android, and he gave us this a review. Hey, what's up? I'm Jason Howell, and I am here with the Samsung Galaxy Tab 3 8.0. Kind of weird that they have the two names there, but basically it's the Series 3 of the Galaxy Tab. This is the 8 inch screen version. And you can kind of tell if you're a Samsung fan at all, it looks a lot like the Galaxy S4. Basically, you know, their design language is very, very close to uh, each other, be it the phones as well as the tablets, they all look very similar. So if you're a fan of that style, you're probably gonna like this uh, device. Dual core 1.5 gigahertz Exynos 4 processor inside uh, with 1.5 gigs of RAM. It has that eight inch LCD screen that I told you about. It's 1280 by 800 resolution. So it's not necessarily a full 1080p display. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, 16 gigs of internal storage on this device, although there is a 32 gig model. Uh, micro SD card slot if you need even more than that. There's a five megapixel rear facing camera on the back and then a front megapixel, uh, front Racing camera of 1.3 megapixels, a 4450 milliamp hour battery inside that is non-removable. This case does not come off. Uh, it also has an IR blaster that you can see right there. So if you want to use it with your stereo or your home theater system, you can. This device is running 4.2.2. Jelly Bean, and it should be noted that there is no NFC on this device, so if that's a, a deal breaker for you, you're not gonna find it here. Uh, we'll start with the design. I mean, as I said, it looks a lot like the Galaxy S4, just like a bigger version of it, obviously. Uh, it has the plastic design, but thankfully, and I'm not the hugest fan of, of plastic when it comes to the design of tablets and phones, but it feels pretty sturdy, pretty solid, uh, considering you don't get a lot of like those creaks when you, when you bend the device or anything like that. Often, my complaint with a tablet is that the edges are so sharp that it digs right into the palm of your hands and it becomes really uncomfortable over time. So the rounded corners are definitely appreciated. You have a little bit of the kind of faux chrome uh, outlinings on the sides, as well as the stylings around the camera, which kind of give it a nice little pop. Still a menu button, uh, a capacitive menu button on the device. Samsung has clung hard to the menu button, even though Google has pretty much said with Android, I think it was uh, Jelly Bean uh, initially, that the menu button's going away. And now onto performance, which is where the tablet kind of starts to fall apart a little bit. Dual core processor, which some people would say, hey, you know, that's, that's gonna be sufficient for most needs. But I kind of saw it like in the responsiveness, you can see the notification pull down. Sometimes it would take me two to three times to get it to register uh, a touch uh, in doing that. Other times it would pull down fine. It just really, you never know what you're gonna get. Browsing the web, uh, was okay, but again, when you're scrolling through a big web page, there's just a little bit of extra jitteriness when you're scrolling through, and you, you detect it more and more over time. Playing games, I played Dead Trigger 2, Riptide GP2, Real Racing 3, and overall, they were, they were pretty enjoyable, but again, just little you know, jittering and uh, stuttering throughout the gameplay that would crop up here and there that would just kind of pull you out of the experience. Uh, the camera is almost not even really worth talking about and cameras on tablets rarely ever amount to much, but on here you get what I would expect, you know, pretty washed out photos unless you're in excellent punchy light. It's probably 
best uh, suited for video conferencing. Battery, what more can I say? Solid performance, the battery didn't really run out on me, although I did notice that standby time, if I left it in my bag uh, for a little while, you know, wouldn't last more than a couple of days. Standby time actually seemed to not be that great. And then of course, there's the software, which is Samsung's TouchWiz UI. Uh, certainly has its fans. I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm the hugest fan of TouchWiz, but I really gave it a shot here. A multi-window mode that allows you to pull up two different uh, pages side by side, that was really handy. Smart Stay, which actually uses these sensors to track your eyes, and if your eyes are staring at the screen and it knows it, it'll keep the screen on. Doesn't matter what your screen time at timeout settings are. There is no gesture support on here though, like there is on the S4, so keep that in mind. And I just have to go ahead and go on the record and say the Samsung built-in keyboard is horrible. I Man, I, I you get more wrong than you ever get right with the Samsung keyboard. But uh, overall, you know, TouchWiz brings a certain level of extra features to their devices, to Samsung devices. And if that's something that you're looking for, a little bit extra on the software side, then TouchWiz is excellent for that. All right, now let's take a look at the pros of the Samsung Galaxy Tab 3 8.0. First, there's the display, which like I said, it's a 720 display, but it's perfectly sufficient and a very nice display uh, considering that. Uh, some software features that are included with TouchWiz are actually very handy and useful, so that gives you a little bit of extra usefulness out of your tablet purchase. Uh, on the con side, I would definitely say performance and responsiveness were an issue throughout the user experience, and uh, I definitely noticed it more the, the more I used the tablet. And then price compared to the competition. You know, the, the uh, iPad mini is only, you know, maybe 20 or 30 bucks more than the Galaxy Tab 3 8.0. The Nexus 7 is better spec in some ways, and it's definitely a lot less than this tablet is, so price is definitely an issue here. Having said all that, it's not that this tablet is necessarily bad in any real way, but it's also not really great in any real way either. I don't walk away from this review thinking that there's one particular thing that this tablet is especially good at. And you, you know, if you're gonna recommend it to people to buy, you want at least some reason to recommend them to do so. If you're a big uh, fan of Samsung, touch whiz, their hardware aesthetic, you're probably gonna like this device. For everyone else, there are much better options out there in this eight, seven to eight inch form factor for tablets uh, at possibly a lesser price than the Samsung Galaxy Tab 3 8.0. I'm Jason Howell, and you can check out all of my reviews on all about Android at twit.tv slash AAA. Thanks for watching my review. Thank you to Jason Howell uh, from All About Android Galaxy Tab 3, not the Note 3. I have the Note 3. <laughs> that's the one I reviewed. That's the phone that's only slightly smaller uh, than this one. Let's talk laptops. HP has a new uh, laptop it calls the ZBook. Our very own Shannon Morse, the producer of this show, uh, co-host of Coding 101, uh, and a regular, of course, on Hack 5, took a look at the ZBook. Shannon? Hi, my name is Shannon Morse. I'm the producer of Before You Buy, and today I have the HP ZBook 14, which looks like a regular laptop, right? An Ultrabook, but in reality, it is a mobile workstation. So this baby costs, well, starting at $13.99, but it can go all the way up to $23.99, a little bit more than that. The one that I have here is $23.99, so a little over two grand. And it is targeted towards not your usual consumers, but a, a engineering market. So this is for your editors and your animation workers, your CAD workers. So this is made for professionals. And honestly, when you see the insides of this, you can really tell it's made for professionals. So I'm gonna do something right now. This looks a little crazy, but, oh no, I broke it. All right, not really, but you can see here that you have a lot of upgrade options. You can pull things out. You can swap the battery on the insides. We have Windows 7 Professional bit, which is great, 64-bit. It also includes an Intel fourth generation i7 processor, so top of the line, excellent quality. You also get, get this, 16 gigs of RAM because who doesn't need 16 gigs of RAM, right? And there's also a 240 gig solid state drive. Some of the cheaper options do include hard disk drives if you want more memory on that side instead of the smaller solid state drive, but I prefer solid states myself. It also includes Bluetooth 4.0 and Wi-Fi, but there is an option, an upgradable option for 4G, mo uh, 4G mobile broadband module as well. And you can just simply plug that in and upgrade it. Yay, how fun. 
Now the GPU, that's discrete graphics. It includes an AMD Fire Pro M4100. So that's fun too, yay! So I really, really like the upgrade options on this and the fact that you can just upgrade your RAM, you can upgrade your solid state drive if you want to, you can swap out your battery while you're on the go. Say you're in your car and you're going to your next on the field job, swap out your battery, put the new one in. Very important for professionals and I really like that they included that. So on the right side we have DisplayPort, a USB 3.0, there's two USB 3.0s, and a full Ethernet port, which is very important when you're on the go. There's also a hidden SD card on the bottom, it includes a little docking station for that, and there is a docking station for your Elite uh, HP books, so you can dock it into a, a docking station as well if you're just sitting at your desk. On the other side we have a Kensington lock. VGA and two more USB 3.0s as well as a smart card port. So pretty much everything that you could want, the only thing I think is missing would be HDMI, but you do have your docking port and your other display ports, so not too bad. The webcam on this is 720p. Honestly, with that professional grade quality, um, I think 720p is just fine for a webcam. And the speakers do get pretty decently loud on this. They're pretty average for a laptop. Now let's move on to the screen. This is a 14 inch anti-glare screen, very important when you're out in the sunlight, of course, on the field again. And it's 1920 by 1080. A little bit lower resolution, but not too bad. Again, it's full HD, so I'm okay with that. The keyboard and the touchpad on this are so, so nice. I'm always super picky when it comes to my touchpad, so I'm absolutely in love with this thing. The keyboard is a chiclet keyboard, but it's spaced far apart, far enough apart that it gives you no problems whenever you're trying to type out reports and things like that. The touchpad is very smooth, it's very easy to use, it doesn't stick, you don't find yourself moving around on the screen where you're not trying to click, so it's very useful. And there's also a physical right and left click buttons. And for you guys out there who are still used to having a pointing stick in the middle, the little nub in the middle of the keyboard, it's there for you just in case you needed it. So let's move on to my pros and cons with this device. First off, the pros. It's lightweight. It's a lightweight workstation, under four pounds. You really can't get better than that when you're going for a professional grade quality machine for your workstation. Also, it's upgradable. I mean, who doesn't want upgrading options on their mobile workstation? That's so cool. The touchpad is excellent. And of course, anti-glare, perfect for when you're in the field. On my con side, it does have a little bit lower resolution than some other uh, options out on the market right now, and it is a little bit pricey at over two grand. So, would this be a buy, try, or a don't buy? Well, I have to say it's definitely a buy. Obviously, I'm not the target market for this. I'm not a CAD person, I'm not an engineer, but for the video editors out there, for the guys who are on the field all the time moving around, they're architectural engineers and whatnot, definitely a buy. I just love the fact that you can upgrade all the options underneath the bottom of this guy. It's so nice to do that. So yeah, it's a buy. Again, I'm Shannon Morse, and this is the HP ZBook 14. That's Shannon Morse, the producer of Before You Buy. She liked it. <laughs> Let's give it to Shannon. Shannon likes it. Uh, coming up in just a bit, we're going to take a look at mice and uh, maybe this little guy uh, here, the highly strokeable Mac Pro. But first, a reminder, all of our reviews uh, are available online, not only at our website, twit.tv slash BYB, but also, of course, on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Before You Buy. And what we've done with those is we've we've... You know, you can get the whole show at uh, Twit, but we've taken the uh, individual reviews and chopped them up. So if you want to, you know, you want to say, hey, uh, you know, Dad, you're, you're interested in buying the Galaxy Tab 3, here's a review. And you could just send them uh, the link to the YouTube channel and they just get that review. So that's YouTube.com slash B, I'm sorry, before you buy. You want to email us, let us know something you'd like to have reviewed. Of course, BYB at Twit.tv. We love hearing from you. Before we go on with a, a look at uh, the Death Adder. Let's take a look at our fine sponsor, audible.com. You know I'm a big Audible fan. I live uh, on audiobooks from audible.com. Fortunately, you know, when I started in 2000, it was great then, but the selection was, I don't know, thousands. Now it's 150,000. What else that's happened is that Audible really has got the recognition of the public, publishing industry. So when a new book comes out, the latest Danielle Steele or Stephen King, it comes out on Audible the same day it comes out in the bookstore. That's really great. It means you don't have to wait to get an audio version of your favorite book. 
And it doesn't even do it justice to say audio. They get the best re readers that really bring books to life. Right now, I'm listening to Brad Stone's incredible uh, book about Amazon.com, the everything store. Uh, and by the way, we interviewed uh, Brad on Triangulation uh, this past week. Highly recommend this, not just because it's an interesting story. We all are Amazon fans, and it really is a behind-the-scene look at how this amazing store works. But it's also a really great education in business. I mean, Jeff Bezos is brilliant. Love this book, love the narration, and you can get it for free if you go to audiblepodcast.com slash before you buy. You'll be signing up for that uh, gold plan. That's the book a month. But your first month's free. Your first book is free. Cancel any time in the first 30 days. You'll pay nothing. The book is yours to keep forever. You also get the daily digest of either the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Really nice. I mean, it, it takes a commute and just makes it go by, fly by. Same thing, uh, you know, doing the dishes, walking the dog, anything where you'd like to read, but you just, your hands aren't free to hold a book. Audible. In fact, frankly, at this point, I'm such an Audible fan. I listen even when I could be reading a book. That's how I consume great literature, nonfiction, history, uh, thrillers, and, of course, the best science fiction in the world. Audiblepodcast.com slash before you buy. Well, everybody knows, uh, I think, uh, about the Razer mice. It's a great gaming mouse. But do you know about the Genius Cam, the Genius Energy, or the Phoenix? A mouse roundup. Next, with Padre S.J., Father Robert Balasser of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Let's take a look. I'm Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, with a specialty mouse roundup for Before You Buy. We've got two combo mice from Genius, a left-handed gaming mouse from Razer, and an executive mouse from Phoenix. The cam mouse is a corded USB optical mouse from Genius, with an integrated camera on the underside of the unit. As an optical device, the cam mouse is, well, a mouse. With three buttons plus a scrolling wheel, it's a competent, if not entirely unique design. Where it becomes interesting is when the mouse is flipped over and a trapdoor reveals a camera. The two megapixel sensor is triggered by a button on the left side of the mouse and Genius positions it as a way to scan QR codes and take quick pictures for use on the internet. The Genius Cam Mouse sells for about $22. The wireless energy mouse is another combination device from Genius, putting together a 1200 DPI 2.4 GHz wireless mouse and a 2700 mAh battery for powering USB devices. The mouse portion of the combo is actually pretty good. It's large enough to comfortably cup in an average size hand, and the three button plus scroll wheel design is responsive and clicky. The underside of the mouse has an on off switch and a slot that serves as the storage bin for the wireless transceiver. On the charging side, the Genius Mouse has a charging port at the front of the mouse and a standard USB port on the back. A button below the scroll wheel activates the battery and a 4 LED indicator tells you how much charge is left in the mouse. The mouse can charge most all non-tablet USB devices and it has a backup battery so that using the charging function won't accidentally kill the mouse. The Genius Wireless Energy Mouse is available for $27. The Razer Death Adder 3500 PC Gaming Mouse is a left-handed version of their popular Death Adder series of devices. Using a 3500 DPI Razer Precision 3.5G infrared laser sensor and a 5-button configuration, the Death Adder has a 1 millisecond response time and 1 GHz polling. This allows for on-the-fly adjustment of DPI and liquid smooth movement. Anybody who has ever used a Razer Mouse can expect the same quality build in their left-handed unit. It's responsive, smooth, and stylish with traditional molded sculpting and three Teflon feet. It uses a braided cord, gold-plated connector, and gentle blue illumination. The Razer Death Adder 3500 left-handed edition sells for $57. The Phoenix Nasita is a high-performance gaming mouse with executive style. It features an 8200 DPI Avago 9800 laser engine and lens with a 1 millisecond response time, 12,000 FPS, and 150 inches per second rating. It also sports an in-mouse LCD screen that lets you quickly adjust the resolution settings, even without a computer client. Molded for right-handers, the Nasita is undoubtedly the most comfortable mouse I've ever used. It's well-balanced with a gently sloping palm rest, perfectly sculpted thumb indent, and perfectly placed buttons and scroll wheel. The Nasita glides on four Teflon feet that lets it effortlessly move over even rough surfaces and features a braided cord and gold-plated USB connector. The Phoenix Nasita sells for $97. With the cam mouse on the con side, it has to be the overall construction. 
it's too plasticky, too small, too light, too unbalanced, and just, just not a very well-constructed device. Now, the camera is also a little bit too low resolution to be of any real use. If you're going to do QR codes or simple pictures for the internet, you're probably going to use your camera phone. On the pro side, well, at least it didn't set my house on fire. The Energy Mouse is an interesting device because on the con side, I'd have to say it has a weird port placement. You've got the USB port on the back, you've got the charging port on the front, you've got this slot that carries the transceiver, which I don't really like because it's too easy to bump this off, and if you lose the transceiver, the mouse is useless, which is actually another con. They don't give you a way to actually just connect this to a computer and use it as a wired mouse. On the pro side, it's actually very well constructed. It's got a good feel, it, it has a nice contour, it's got a good weight, and yes, that 2700 milliamp hour battery does come in pretty handy. I'd like to see how it stands up to rigorous use. The Death Adder is a fantastic device. Quick fun fact, I was born left-handed, but I forced myself to use my right hand because we didn't have things like this. Nice construction, nice matte material, very responsive motion, very smooth motion, even the buttons are top-notch. On the con side, well, I can't really think of any. It's so well-constructed and properly priced. Now this is good, but this, the Nasita, is great. This is truly an executive mouse. Everything from the, the size and the weight to the, the molding, the construction, just feels right. I even like the fact that they have that little LCD screen so that I can use the DPI switch without having to use a computer client. They did so many things right about this mouse, and the only con is price. Now, just less than $100, it is a bit on the pricey side, but then again, you get what you pay for. So try, buy, or don't buy. For the cam mouse, it has to be a don't buy. For the energy mouse, I'm going to give it a try. I want to see exactly how long it will stand up to travel use before I give it a, a solid buy. And then for the Death Adder and the Nasita, absolutely a buy. I'm Father Robert Balasser for Before You Buy. I, I agree with Robert. The Death Adder is actually the gaming mouse I use. But remember, I'm a lefty, so uh, that eliminates a lot of mice. And the fact that the Death Adder is uh, agnostic as to which hand you use really for me is... A big, big selling point. Now, I've been watching Black Magic for a long time. You've been watching Black Magic if you've been watching Twit. All of our converters are Black Magic. Our switcher is Black Magic. They're really the kings of high-end but relatively low-cost uh, video production equipment. When they came out, and I think it was a couple of CESs ago, uh, with their cinema cameras, I was blown away. These were cameras that were designed to be very simple, relatively inexpensive, but give you super high-quality imaging. We thought we'd get the newest, the, the Cinema Camera 2.5K, uh, out to uh, our photography gurus, uh, Russell, of course, uh, Russell Tammany, our IT guy, who's a fantastic photography uh, guy, and, uh, and uh, Anthony uh, Nielsen, one of our editors, who, uh, of course, deals with video all the time. Give them a chance to look at this very interesting new camera. I'm, I can't wait for this review. Here we go. Uh, Anthony and uh, Russell and uh, the Black Magic 2.5K. Hi, this is Russell Tammany. I'm Anthony Nielsen. And today we're reviewing the Black Magic Cinema Camera 2.5K. So this camera is pretty unique. It's Black Magic's first sort of entry or foray into the field of professional video cameras. And they've built a really interesting product. This is basically a 2.5K video sensor that's mounted in a body with Canon EF lens mount. So for the connectors on the side, we've got a headphone connector and we've got two audio imports. Now these are uh, fully balanced quarter inch jacks. There's an SDI out connector as well. And below that is a Thunderbolt connector, which can be used for recording the video directly to a Mac or for looking at scopes, but it can't be used for transferring files off. And then there's a power connector that's also used for charging the internal battery or for powering it off of a portable battery pack or a uh, wall adapter. On the other side, we have a SSD dock where it'll record videos in multiple formats, including Apple ProRes 422 high quality, DNX HD for Avid, and then also It's the raw Cinema DNG RAW. 2.5K. Uh, you have 12-bit in RAW and 10-bit in uh, the ProRes and DNX HD, which is very high quality video, whether you use the RAW or the ProRes or DNX HD. And for the display, it's actually a touch display where you can double tap to get a one-to-one -one pixel ratio so you can actually control the focus. And also you just tap and uh, enter metadata. Sure. And all the, all the controls are really rather simple. It's all touchscreen based. So you can enter into a menu and then uh, 
go through the options and settings. There's really not too many options and settings. Yeah. You won't really be overloaded with, you know, how many options there are, which on a lot of professional cameras, you know, you got to get out the manual and read the manual to figure out what everything means. But it's a real simple product. It's basically, you know, what type of uh, format you want to record in, what's your ISO and white balance, you know, really not much other than that. Other features, uh, you have your iris, which will automatically make sure you're not clipping your exposure. So you're just right under 100% exposure. Then also focus, which will highlight the focus area. This really isn't the, the normal kind of product that we'd review here on Before You Buy, because it's not really intended to be a consumer product. Um, it's really intended to be a professional video recorder. And, you know, as being a professional video recorder, there's sort of some limitations to that, that, you know, this produces some absolutely stunning quality video. However, you're not going to just take it out of the box and get that level of video uh, without, you know, having either the right equipment or the right production and the right preparation. So one of the things that you might notice is that it's not easy to just grab and hold. It, it doesn't really have a way to hold it steady. You really want to have like a follow focus setup. You want to have a, a you know, a mounting rig. rig, a cage. Yeah. You want to have all of this gear that you, you bolt onto it so that you can effectively utilize this, uh, this camera. So it doesn't necessarily come, you know, ready to shoot, no. and ready to go. Obviously you're going to need a lens. One of the interesting things is that the crop factor is somewhere between 2.3 and 2.4 X. And that's, that's relatively significant because your general crop cameras are only around 1.6 to 1.7. And it can take your 35 millimeter lens and turn it into an 85 millimeter telephoto. And then there's also a compatibility list. Not every single Canon EF lens works with the aperture control or works perfectly with it. So you still might want to take a look at that list before assuming it's going to work with your lenses. Yeah. We should also mention that this camera comes in a micro four thirds. Yeah. So there, there's a micro four thirds. Which um, is closer to the Oh yeah, Robert the Micro Four Thirds is, is a lot closer to the actual native sensor size. One of the big features this camera touts is 13 stops of dynamic range. Having 13 stops of dynamic range, what that means in practice is that you can shoot a scene that has a lot of contrast, like from dark to bright. But what you get back out of that file is sort of more like a raw image. It's, it's a lot like what you'd get out of a DSLR without processing the image at all. So it's sort of like, you know, you haven't applied contrast and saturation, sort of like color grading. So what you see in the film profile when you get it back is a very flat and neutral image. And at first you're wondering like, you know, why is, is this, <laughs> you know, image look like this? Yeah. You know, this, this camera is supposed to be amazing. And then as you take the image in and process it, you realize that you can bring whatever character you want out of that image. You can, you know, make it poppy and vivid and, and sharp. Yeah. You can make it muted and, and look a lot like a natural film. And you have all the latitude of actually working with the video once you get it back to make creative decisions, you know, in your timeline where I had this 38 minutes of video and now I could go in and take each individual section and decide how I wanted to process that section and how I wanted it to look and what color profile I wanted it to have. To get the most dynamic range and to get the most quality out of the camera, you have to shoot it in the two and a half K raw mode. Correct. And when you do that, um, how much uh, can I fit on a 256 gig SSD? <laughs> Well, it, you know, raw, raw yeah. is relatively large. No, it's uh, it's about five megabits per frame. So, on a 256 in 30 at 24 frames, you'd run out in 30 minutes. Okay, and so that's, so for every 30 minutes, you're gonna have about 250 gigabytes. Correct. Of video. And then not only that, you're gonna have to ingest it using Blackmagic's DaVinci Resolve, which you actually include with this, which is a pretty good deal considering that's a thousand dollars. Yeah, so that's that's Blackmagic's um, kind of color grading and mm -hmm. processing software. For pros and cons, we, we both, both kind of basically did them separately and then and then looked at our notes and realized that we both yeah, have same, the same pro yeah. and cons. One is for a little under $2,000. Like there's yeah, no I mean, other the, the way you can get this quality. This is $2,000 know? and this is fantastic quality video. It's sort of like the difference between shooting JPEG and RAW on a DSLR. Which comes uh, to our next pro is picture quality, which picture is quality. just amazing. I've shot stuff with a lot of different SLRs and um, you know mirrorless cameras and things like that. And I've not seen video quality like this, you know, back on my, you plug it back in, load the video up in uh, Premiere or Final Cut, and you look at the video and you're just like, wow, this is, you know, this is production quality. This is something right. that you could put out. 
on a major network. Which leads to my next pro, which is the reason why you can tweak that image is the recording formats, which, you know, on an SLR, you'll have MPEG-4. Yeah, like an SLR already records to some sort or of lossy, compressed, or lossy. you know, a AVC, you know, kind of format where you get this kind of compressed look. And now you have to take that compressed stuff and edit it and compress it again. What about your cons? So the first major con that I noticed was the audio issue. You know, you can't. The onboard mic is really terrible. It's basically just so you have audio on your track so you could sync up your clean audio that yeah, you use on a recorder. It's not intended fact. to be used as no, an actual audio not. track. No. And it picks up the fan noise. And even when you use the quarter inch jacks on the side, they are balanced. And so you can use um, an actual XLR microphone with them with the right cable. However, it won't provide phantom power. And the audio quality of it just didn't seem that great. So I would highly recommend using an external recorder and then just mm -hmm. syncing the audio up. Another con is um, there's no media management on the camera itself. You're gonna have to pull the hard drive out. Right. So you saw that you we, we can we can label the clips. Yeah, you could label the clips just fine, and you know add tags. But and you could play through them. But you can't. There's no way to delete it. There's no way to delete the clip. And or, so if you if you yeah. accidentally were recording a bunch and you wanted to kill that clip, you no. you, you have to dump it to a computer. Yeah, and there's actually no way of seeing how much space is left on the hard drive either. Right. And um, I think I think my final con, which you agree with as well is just the battery life. Oh yeah. It, it the built-in battery, it's nice that it has it as opposed to not having a built-in battery. Right, right. Um, but it really just doesn't last long enough to use in the field. So you're going to have to be carrying around battery packs which are a little clunky and then you got a cable to attach. Yeah. I mean it, it would have been nice if it had a an interchangeable battery. That's the big problem. Is not being yeah. able to swap the battery for yeah. another battery means that you have to have a battery pack with the DC yeah. adapter. Buy, try, don't buy? Considering all of these, um, you know, features with this camera and the kind of, you know, it's got some cons, but, you know, I think the pros outweigh the cons, and I think it's Definitely. a buy. Um, it's something that you would have to consider. Uh, you know, I, I sort of wanted to give it a try, but I think I have to give it a buy uh, because if you're the person that's looking for this type of camera, there's nothing else in the price range that you can touch. So, you know, it's... It's definitely a buy, and you can use all the money you save to, you know, buy all of the other gear and the tripods and the need. cages yeah. and the audio recorders and the definitely SSDs and the lenses. Shoulder and mount and everything. Shoulder mount. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. I, too, think it's a buy. If you're that up-and-coming indie filmmaker, this is the thing that you're looking for. That's the Blackmagic 2.5K. There's also a 4K Blackmagic camera. It's a little bit more expensive. But I got to say, yeah, it sounds like a lot, $2,000, but I agree with them. It is it is crazy good uh, for what you get. And we've really been looking at actually replacing our cameras with these kinds of black magic cameras because we can use super high quality lenses and you get such a great cinematic effect. Uh, thank you very much, Russell and Anthony. Could you just uh, put the camera on my desk on your way out? Thanks so much. Now, let me show you my new baby. If you watched Mac Break Weekly earlier today, you saw me fondling the Mac Pro and I owe a real debt of gratitude to a guy named Ed Ingber. He is a ham and a, and a watcher, a viewer. He... He owns a brick. He bought this Mac Pro. I think they went on sale like, what, December 19th? But if you didn't get up at midnight and order it, you still don't have it. Only, only people who ordered in the first few hours before 3 a.m. were able to get their Mac Pros uh, before the end of the year. The rest of us, and that included me, had to wait. Now, Ed bought his, he says at 1 a.m., uh, and uh, decided he didn't want it. He thought, you know, as great as the Mac Pro looks to be, it's very expensive, I just need a, an iMac. So he sent me an email and said, would you like to take my Mac Pro, pay, you know, buy it for me at cost? Uh, and I said, yes. So that's how we have one so early. A lot of you are still waiting for your Mac Pro. We all saw the Apple reveal. In fact, who could forget Phil Schiller, the director of marketing at Apple, showing off this amazing extruded aluminum cylinder back at the Worldwide Developers Conference in June and saying, can't innovate my ass. Well, it is innovative. In fact, this is a very interesting design. At first, and I have to say, I was one of many people who kind of poo-pooed it, saying, oh, they're just showing off. But I got to tell you, they're not. This design is actually very practical. Practical. Now, this is a very a dense, thick, extruded aluminum. So, of course, this conducts. And then there's only one fan, and it's a big fan in the bottom that blows air up through a hollow core, a thermal core in the middle, and then out the top. So the key on the new Mac Pro is that you have to keep the bottom clear and the top clear. Now, I've exercised this thing like crazy. I've made it do the hardest work I've made any computer do, and it never even broke a sweat. It literally did not get hot. It's also dead silent, so quiet that 
when I first hooked up an external drive, I said, what is that whining sound? Is my Mac Pro... Oh, it's the hard drive inside the external drive. This thing is silent. So a beautiful but very functional design. They highlighted the fact that when you turn it, it lights up the connectors. And let's take a look at the connectors. You'll see four USB 3 connectors. There are six Thunderbolt 2 connectors, two gigabit Ethernet ports, of course, audio in and out, and, and then the usual you know, HDMI port, on-off switch, and power plug. That's it. This is an... Oh, oh there's one more switch. And I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to take a chance. You can also... Lit, well, I'll have to disconnect everything, but you can lift this off. I should do that, shouldn't I? I'll do it at the end. I'll tell you what, because I'll have to disconnect everything. But you can lift this off like Darth Vader's helmet and see inside it. And you see what a beautiful design this is. No moving parts. It's one of the reasons it's so quiet. SSD drives, dual PCI Express buses. That means they're very, very fast. The ROM is removable and upgradable, one of the few things you can upgrade in here. Although other world computing, when they took it apart and I fixed it too, noted that the CPU, the Xeon CPU in here, was socketed. So in theory, you can upgrade the CPU at some point down the road. You can also, in theory, upgrade the dual uh, video cards in here. Now, the starting configuration uh, is a whopping $3,000. And by the way, that doesn't include mouse, monitor, keyboard, just the cylinder, a plug, and two black Apple stickers. $3,000. You may be spending even more. You'll see the next level up, the six-way uh, Intel Xeon E5 uh, running at 3.5 gigahertz is $4,000 with 16 gigs of RAM. And uh, you can go on up. You're probably going to want to load it up because the kind of people who buy this are not so price sensitive. They're professionals who are editing video or rendering 3D objects, doing high-end Photoshop, something that they need a lot of speed because, frankly, this is overkill for almost everybody else. If, if you're doing spreadsheets, if you're doing simple Photoshop, you don't need this. And the fact that it's so expensive perhaps makes it prohibitive uh, in terms of something that you'd want to have on your desk. You'll note how small it is. Uh, you really don't get a sense of it until you're in, in person. In fact, it's easy to lift. Oh, I just, I, I shouldn't have flipped that switch. Well, as long as we've done that and rebooted the machine, let's unplug it and I can show you what's inside here. Um, I, I flipped this unlock switch inadvertently. And so now I can just lift this off and you can see, here's the fan. Here's the thermal core going through. The CPU is underneath in here. It's got dual GPUs. There's one. Uh, there's the other on top of that. I believe that's the hard drive. This is the, uh, the RAM on standard sticks there and the connectors. The reason there's so many connectors, well, there's really very little you can upgrade in here. You're absolutely going to want to get, for instance, an external Thunderbolt 2 drive. You're going to want to get a, a 4K monitor. It's fast enough to support that. But here's the problem. If you buy it right now, there are very few good Thunderbolt 2 choices. Uh, in fact, as far as I can tell, there's one or two. Almost all of them are coming soon. You don't want to get a Thunderbolt 1 drive. This is, for instance, a, uh, a Buffalo drive with a Thunderbolt interface, but it's not very fast. It's a slow drive inside. And really, this is basically a USB 3 device that they've added a Thunderbolt interface to. It's in all likelihood to keep up with the speed on this, you're going to want to get Thunderbolt 2 SSD drives. Those are going to cost you more than the computer itself. Furthermore, if you really want to take advantage of the 4K display, there's only one in the Apple Store right now. That's the Sharp for $3,500. There's an Asus out there as well that uh, supports the faster refresh rates you want. That's also $3,000. The inexpensive 4K displays we're seeing from companies like Lenovo at CES are only 30 hertz refresh rate, and I do not recommend them. So $3,000 to start for the Mac Pro, another $3,000 for a single 30-inch monitor, and you're probably going to want a RAID enclosure with SSD or very fast hard drives on the Thunderbolt 2. That's going to set you back at least $1,500. Suddenly you realize this is a $10,000 computer. <laughs> and most people don't need it, but if you're one of the people who does, it is a wonderful thing. I have to say, I don't need it, but I brought it home, I fired it up, started playing with it, and I fell in love immediately. This is a computer with personality. Apple is the best at making computers that, that just make you kind of love them. I love the design. I was a little skeptical at first. If you need a computer with this kind of power and you know who you are, there is nothing, no PC, nothing that can compare to the brand-new 2013 
Mac Pro. Pros and cons. The pros, of course, the design, the industrial design is gorgeous, well thought out, and highly functional, I have to say. It really does the job. Uh, it's also extraordinarily fast. When I did the benchmarks on the SSD, I saw speeds that I'd never seen before. It reads, according to the Black Magic, uh, Magic Disk benchmark, it reads these internal SSDs at very close to a gigabyte per second. Imagine transferring data at a gigabyte per second. Unbelievable. Um, the cons, well, you're going to need some very expensive peripherals. In fact, the whole thing is just ridiculously expensive. However, I've got to say, if you're the person who needs this kind of speed, or you've got enough money and you, and you really have an appreciation for design, there's no question in my mind, this is a buy. I like this better than I thought. This is the Mac Pro 2013. Apple's just knocked this one out of the park. And that's it for Before You Buy. I hope you enjoyed our show. Our thanks to our producer, Shannon Morse, and all of our reviewers. A thanks to you for watching. We now do Before You Buy on Tuesday afternoons right after Security Now. So given Steve's prolixity, that's probably about 3.30 Pacific time, 6.30 Eastern time. Let's do some quick math. I think 23.30 UTC on twit.tv. We do love it if you watch live, but never fear. There's always on-demand versions of this show after the fact. Audio, video at twit.tv slash BYB. And, of course, as I mentioned, on YouTube at youtube.com slash before you buy. I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you got to watch before you buy. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.